why are derivative volumes larger than physical ones? Now, I've got a lot of notes here because there are a lot of questions about that. Please explain. Why is it that we have paper volume markets much larger than the physical volume? And the simple answer is that because derivative markets are paper markets or future markets, but it's not just futures, it's futures, forwards, options, and a variety of other issues, uh, products. They're more efficient for hedging. If you're a producer, a refiner, a smelter, a fabricator, a wholesaler, a retailer, a manufacturer of products that have silver and other commodities, Futures, options, forward, other derivatives are much more efficient for hedging your price exposure. And for the short-term investment, they're also more efficient. There's better liquidity. There's better transparency. They're leveraged in most cases. So, you know, you put a dollar into an ounce of silver and it goes up. A dollar, you've made a dollar. You put 15 cents into an ounce of silver in the futures market, and it goes up a dollar. You just made a dollar on a 15 cent investment. They're more flexible. It provide better financing, partly because, especially with futures and options, if they're exchange traded, there are exchanges monitoring those counterparties in there, and there are regulators monitoring the exchanges as well as the counterparties. So they're easier to finance because there's more information. Now, second point, this relationship of larger derivatives markets than physical markets is true across markets. It's true in all the other commodities. It's true in stocks and bonds and currency. And in fact, when you look at gold and silver and you see these very large ratios of the amount of gold and silver derivatives traded relative to the underlying physical supply and demand, maybe 10 times as much, maybe more. And you say, well, where do I find those kinds of relationships, that kinds of paper to physical ratios? I don't find them in aluminum or copper or corn or oats so much. I find them in currency and in treasury bills because gold and silver are traded much more as financial assets than they are as physical commodities or industrial or consumption oriented commodities. So that's some of the reasons. Now, you know, many, if not most participants that invest in trade and use derivatives would not switch to physical assets if those derivative markets didn't exist. There's this, this uh, misunderstanding that if you didn't have the futures market, all those people would be trading physical metal and uh, the price would rise. That's not true. Most of those people have no interest in trading physical metal. They like the leverage. They like the liquidity. They like the ease of transactions in the futures market and the options market. And if those futures and options did not exist, they would not be trading physical metal. You can also, also argue, and there's data to support it, that the existence of those futures and options and forwards increase the liquidity, increase the uh, participation in these markets, and actually can reduce the volatility uh, in some markets and uh, increase the volume of, of activity and increase the price. When you start saying, well, do futures and options increase or decrease the price? The answer is yes. Varies from market to market, commodity to commodity. Okay. The final thing is the manipulation issues. Derivatives make manipulation of silver or any other market harder and easier to undertake. Easier because they're there, but harder because other market participants can more easily take positions to counter the manipulative trades. And in my 46 years of being in commodities markets and working for a long time at J. Aaron, one of the 12 largest precious metals trading companies at the time, and Goldman Sachs, 
And Jay Aaron was one of the largest currency trading companies at the time as well. You know, we have seen, because of the increased transparency, you have seen times when someone is taking a position in the market that's very large with a view, not necessarily to manipulate the market, but they're taking a view for whatever reasons, and they're taking a large position. And that can be seen in the market, and people will take trade positions opposite that to counter that large participant's activity. You don't see that in the physical market so much because they're not as transparent. Does the size of the derivative debt market affect the spot market price of silver? Okay, derivative debt market, I think the questioner was talking about the silver derivatives, and I think I've pretty much addressed that. But I put this in here because I wanted to bring up something else. One of the sad things is the term spot price is misused, or it's used in various connotations with various definitions. Spot price can be the price right now, today. And, and, and traders will talk about T, trading day one, and then that's T plus one, okay, and T plus two. You know, if I do a trade in the physical market on day one, uh, T plus one, I pay for that if I'm buying. And on day two, I take delivery of what I paid for. Uh, that's a spot transaction. But the term spot is also used to talk, to refer to the over-the-counter market, including T plus two, T plus 30, you know, forwards and future dated forward markets in the over-the-counter market. And you'll find that people don't understand that. So they talk about spot markets and spot prices, and they'll confuse the difference between a spot price um, that is the price right now. I just walked into a coin shop. What's the price? That's a spot price. And a spot price, meaning a price maybe next week or on delivery at some future point uh, in the over-the-counter market. That's what I'm thinking. Another important thing is which spot price. You know, he's seeing marketeers all the time, you know, we will sell you silver at spot, at 10 cents over spot. You know, what spot price are you talking about? Are you talking about the London spot price? Or are you talking about the spot price in New York? Or are you talking about your spot price? Because anybody can set a spot price and say, this is my price on this spot. So you have to be very careful when people are talking about spot pricing. Um, does the derivative size of the derivatives market affect the silver market? Yes, there are far more participants in the silver market providing far more liquidity on both the buy side and the sell side than would exist in the absence of a derivative market. Does that increase the price of silver or decrease the price of silver? Yes. There are times when you can identify increased volumes in the derivatives market having a positive effect driving the price up, and other times when you can find it driving the price lower. And for those conspiracy theorists, if you do the math, if you do the study, if you count the times when large trading in the derivatives market drive the price up on a daily basis, or drive the price down, more often than not, heavy volume of trading in the derivatives market is driving the price up and not down. We've done the math. It's complicated because of the millions of trades every day, uh, but you can see it. It's not, it's there. And the last thing is, because there are other questions which I may or may not have written down, um, what drives, what determines the price of silver? Derivatives trading, futures and options trading, has a very large influence on intraday prices and day-to-day -day prices and maybe even weekly and monthly prices. But the longer-term price is determined by the physical market fundamentals of supply, demand, investment demand, and inventory. And the derivatives trading cues off of that longer term price. 
Sorry, but that's just the way it is. Here's the price of silver. I've been talking about it. You know, back in the 70s when I started getting started, the price was, well, my parents were interested in silver when in the price was 85 cents an ounce. Uh, and I was aware of that. Um, but, you know, the price of silver was less than 5000 Shot up to 50 well, $49, $48 on a very brief period, like 20 minutes or less. In January of 19, it came down. It averaged about $37 in nominal term in 19, in, in the, in that month. Uh, it averaged about $21, $22 for the full year in 1980. It went down and we had this long period of low prices, three and a half to five and a half dollars. Started to rise around 2001, 2003. Rose very sharply in 2011. We had the Great Recession, the global financial crisis, and then the international sovereign debt crisis and the downgrading of the U.S. Treasury creditworthiness all between 2007 and 2011. And the price of silver spiked up to about $49 and some odd cents, just under $50 at the end of April of 2011, at which point CPM Group said sell. And five days later, it was $32 an hour. We had another quiet period, and now we're in another period. So when I say to people that I think the silver price is high, I'm thinking partly from a historical perspective, but I'm also thinking in terms of the costs of production, the availability of supply, the availability of inventories, the availability of jewelry and silverware that can be and is at, on an ongoing basis melted down into refined bullion. Yeah, there are a variety of factors that will tell you. You look at these prices. You know, the average price of silver was thirty-five dollars in nineteen in two thousand eleven. Oh, maybe two. I think it was two thousand eleven. And you could see the price above thirty dollars was a very brief experience. The price above twenty-two dollars has been a more persistent uh, experience for a longer period of time. Yeah, it's not a record price, but it's a very high price. And it's a high price for producers, for mine developers, and for fabricators. Are we fearful? How fearful are we? Are we fearful enough to take possession of our stock market certificates? No, we're not. But we are fearful enough to have paper records of everything that we own. Because if you rely on those digital re records, uh, given the vulnerabilities in the electronic world, the hackers and manipulators and governments shutting down electricity systems, um, you should have paper records of what you've had. If there is some kind of crisis like that, you know, people aren't going to just roll over and die. Uh, there will be a grand program to sort of figure out who owns what. And in that situation, you want to have paper records. I'm sorry, but this is mine. You might have disputes, uh, but you will have records that you can do that. Do you need to take delivery of those stock market certificates? No, but you should have paper records of what you own because that could become much more important. The four fundamentals that we look at uh, you know, people, the question was, how do you look at silver markets? Well, the, the four fundamental pillars that we talk about in the silver market, total supply, which includes mine production, but also includes secondary recovery of scrap, which accounts for more than 20% of annual newly refined silver. Fabrication demand across industries and uses and geographic locations. And when we talk about fabrication demand, we talk about the use of silver in product. We don't talk about the, the final purchase of silver bearing product. So we might talk about silver use in electronics that go into automotive. And we talk about that where the silver is used in making those electronic components not where the auto is. 
not so much important in silver. Well, it is important in silver, uh, but like, for example, in the auto industry, in the platinum market, people talk about where the platinum, palladium, and rhodium are being used. And, you know, catalysts are manufactured in a handful of countries, but cars are bought elsewhere all over the world. And you have to pay attention to where the platinum, if you're a platinum market analyst, you have to pay attention to where the platinum, palladium, and rhodium are being used, not where the cars are being built. Investment demand and inventories. And we had a lot of questions about all sorts of silver inventories. When you reference charts, total inventories, and the decline in 2011 with inventories generally in a balance now, I'm not quite sure what that meant. How do you determine total inventories? Get to that. What is included in these figures? ETFs are included if they have physical metal backing them. COMEX uh, reported inventories along with Shanghai inventories and London inventories and inventories that are reported by market groups elsewhere. Coins are in our bullion bars and coin data. Jewelry is not. Jewelry is elsewhere because it's not in fungible silver form. So our silver inventory figures are silver that is in the form of fungible silver, either bars or coins. So you say, oh, this is silver. I will buy it. Jewelry, people will say, well, I will buy this for the silver content, but it's going to have to be refined down into silver. And that's going to cost. So there's a big discount for silver and jewelry. Then there is this thing, the standard research we see from the Silver Institute, except or something different. I have no idea what that is. You know, the Silver Institute hired other people to take over the World Silver Survey. And quite frankly, we don't look at their data because it's just not accurate. And there's some really weird numbers. And, you know, people will call us up and say, hey, did you see the World Silver Survey this year? got these strange numbers on inventories and, 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 oh, there's no inventories left if I read this correctly. You know, I'm sorry. You shouldn't be reading that stuff. That's pulp fiction. You know, I, I, sorry, you know, they are a good client of ours and we worked with them since the 1970s. But no, I have no idea what they count. And I don't care to know what they count. I know what we count. I know what counts in the market. And that's, Silver in bullion form. 